Dear beloved community, um, it's such a joy to be together with you on this, the 23rd day of August in the year 2020. Um, it's truly a moment to celebrate being alive. And here we are this evening um, on the last evening where we explore the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, we've been exploring the Noble Eightfold Path for the past two months. And now we've come to the eighth step which is quite exciting. It's quite an achievement. Um, and I'm excited to be sharing about the eighth step of the Noble Eightfold Path with you this evening. Um, I remember back uh, in 1998, Tay, our teacher, shared with us that we should stop running around like an orphan and come back home and realize what we've been all along. Um, in fact, one of the great teachers of our spiritual lineage, Master Rinzai, Master Linchi, or in Vietnamese, he's known as Master Lam Te. He said that we should just be our ordinary selves with nothing further to look for. That if we master the situation that we're in, wherever we stand, everything becomes real, including ourselves, and that we're no longer a victim of our circumstances. And he asks us to reflect on what we're madly running after. Um, whether it's wealth or fame or power, or sometimes we're running after liberation. And he says that the trouble lies, the real core of our problem lies in not believing in ourselves enough, not having enough confidence in our own capacity. And Master Rinzai says, because we don't believe in ourselves enough, uh, we're knocked here and there all over the place by all the conditions in which we find ourselves and invites us to stop focusing all of our attention outside and turn back and realize what we've been all along, to stop clinging to how things were in the past and running after the future. Our teacher, Tay, has often reminded us that our practice, our meditation practice and our spiritual practice is not a practice of hard labor working hard for 20, 30, 40 years or a whole lifetime in order to attain something. But the practice is a practice in which the fruits should be and are immediate. Um, in fact, the Dhamma itself is described as being immediately useful and effective, not uh, useful and effective only after 20 years of hard work, but right here and right now. So here we are this evening at what many of us consider to be the final factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, right concentration or Samma Samadhi. But in fact, the Noble Eightfold Path, contrary to how we normally view journeys, is much more of a spiral journey rather than a journey from, directly from point A to point B. The Noble Eightfold Path, as we manifest it in our lives is a journey of continual unfolding and discovery um, of deeper layers and not a journey that ends um, at a particular moment in time. This is the very big difference between Buddhism as a path or spiritual practice as a path and spiritual or meditation practice as a series of techniques. In terms of right concentration or samasamadhi, it's not necessary to master all of the levels of concentration in order to get to awakening. In fact, many of the root texts in the Pali Canon point out that a deep experience of meditative concentration can be sufficient, a really firm uh, basis for the Dharma to unfold and ripen in and of itself. I remember many years ago when I was transiting in the old airport in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, it was called Subang Jaya. And um, in the airport was an advertisement for an airline. It was a little bit of a cliche, but it uh, is definitely true in terms of the spiritual path and in terms of the Noble Eightfold Path specifically. The sign said, the journey is the destination. 
And this is such a different mentality than the mentality that we're used to. Sama Samadhi, right Samadhi or right concentration or right immersion, which are two other ways to translate um, uh, Samadhi, is, as I shared earlier, the so-called final factor in the Noble Eightfold Path. But the final factor in the wisdom section of the Noble Eightfold Path, the eighth step, in what for some of us seems to be a linear journey leads us right back into the very first step of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right understanding or clear view. The eighth factor, um, right uh, concentration or right immersion, it represents a deepening of a mental factor that's present in every state of our consciousness. At any given moment, um, because of its nature, our mind is aware of something, um, believe it or not, aware of a sight, a sound, a smell, a taste, a touch, or a mental object. As a generalization, the general factor of samadhi, this innate quality that we have that we want to develop, it unifies our mind consciousness on awareness of the object of its attention, which I just, I shared what those were a moment ago, sights, or sounds, or smells, or tastes, or touches, and so on. The commentaries define samadhi itself as the centering of the mind and the mental factors fully and evenly on an object. Samadhi collects together the ordinarily dispersed and dissipated stream of our consciousness into one stream. It's a unification. The two key features of a concentrated mind are unbroken attentiveness to an object, an unbroken beingness with an object, and also a calming and a stilling of our mental um, the mental aspects of, of our mind, our mental functions. Qualities which, as many of us could testify, are, are usually quite different from um, an unconcentrated mind. Samadhi, which we usually translate as concentration, um, is oneness with the object of our attention. Um, it's not a mental concentration as we usually understand it in English. And so I've myself actually begun to turn away from using the term concentration. Um, since when we think of concentration in English, we think of things such as concentrating for um, our final exams or concentrating on something intensely. And as many of us have experienced, that kind of mental concentration leaves you exhausted. The very nature of samadhi is a deep, refreshment. It's deeply restful and satisfying. A sense of dwelling with something, of not being separate from it. When you dwell with somebody, you have a completely different insight about their nature, as anyone who's in a relationship can probably agree. There are various interpretations for the root of the word samadhi. Some can mean together, a putting or joining together or integrated. It can mean to acquire integration or wholeness or truth. It can mean uniformly or fully. And then Adi can mean established. And so all of those translations are quite um, different than our usual sense and our everyday experience of that mental um, concentration that we normal, we tend to mistake samadhi for. Another way that we see samadhi translated um, in um, English is one pointedness, uh, which is, is also an interesting translation. However, it's worth mentioning that not all one pointedness is the same as sama samadhi, is the same as right samadhi. Not all samadhi, um, not all concentration 
in terms of the spiritual path is right concentration. Because most of the time, if we're honest, we tend to focus on the wrong things. Um, the, a good friend of mine, she's a Dharma teacher from uh, Spirit Rock, her name's Anushka. She tells a, a wonderful story of friends of hers who were, um, they went to look for an apartment in San Francisco. So uh, they were at the open house and they were looking around the apartment and looking at all the stove fixtures and the lights and all these kind of things that people are looking for apartments do. And she was actually with them and observing and she noticed that there was a large shoji screen, a large bamboo screen um, over against one wall. And being of a curious nature, as most meditators are, uh, while everybody else was admiring all the fixtures and things like that, she went over and looked behind the screen and saw that um, behind the screen was uh, a large window that was looking right out on a freeway. Um, the, the apartment was actually right next to a, a freeway and that's what their, their view would be all the time. So we tend to focus on, uh, on uh, the wrong things uh, or we tend to focus incompletely um, in a moment. In a conversation to Visaka, the Buddha defines concentration as singleness of mind. But remember, not every instance of mental singleness or focus is right concentration. An assassin about to kill their victim or a person who's bent on revenge. Um, th these people or many other examples, they all act with a concentrated mind, but it would be quite challenging to categorize their, that kind of concentration as right concentration or right samadhi. Right Samadhi by its nature is fully um, beneficial and helpful. Um, it's, a, it's considered to be a wholesome one pointedness. It's the fruit of concentration that emerges from a wholesome or beneficial state of mind. And we've spoken about these in the week that we're exploring the four kinds of right effort. And speaking of right concentration, um, the Buddha also shared about right concentration as noble right concentration. And in the sutras, it's recorded that uh, it, it says, now what friends is noble right concentration in all its fullness? Any singleness of mind that goes along with these seven factors, right understanding, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, is called noble right concentration in all its aspects. So here in this quotation from the Majjhima Nikaya number 117, we see again this beautiful nature of the Noble Eightfold Path as a spiral journey, as a journey of unfolding in which each factor feeds into and is nourished by the others and that each factor contains all the others. Otherwise, it's not a noble path. If we haven't had a chance to cultivate right mindfulness and experience this natural deepening of awareness, that we call one pointedness or concentration or immersion or samadhi, then the Buddha compares our, our mind, if we haven't cultivated right mindfulness, to be like the flapping of a fish uh, when it's taken from the water and it's put onto dry land. The fish just flaps around everywhere. Um, it doesn't, uh, our mind doesn't stay fixed but it rushes from idea to idea, from concept to concept, from story to story, from thought to thought, without often uh, a directedness. If our mind is distracted, then it also tends to be overwhelmed by worries and concerns and sees things only in fragments. And things uh, tend to be distorted by random um, thoughts. But if we train our mind in this quality of mindfulness and concentration that we're exploring this evening, then our mind develops the capacity to rest 
and focus on an object of attention wherever we put our attention easefully. This brings about a softness and a, a kind of a serenity which helps our mind reflect back whatever's there exactly as it is and not uh, our story about something. In the commentaries, we, we learned that there are four possible fruits of developing this capacity of samasamadhi or right concentration. The first is um, a pleasant abiding in the here and now, drishta dharma sukha viharin. And our teacher Tay often speaks about this, to dwell happily in the here and now. And happiness here is not just the usual sense of happiness um, in terms of acquiring things or sensations, but a deep sense of contentment that suffuses our whole being. The second is mindfulness and alertness. And then the third is the attainment of knowledge and vision. So the capacity to know for ourselves and to see clearly into the nature of things. And the fourth fruit is the transformation of suffering. Let's enjoy a sound of the bell. Samadhi, this oneness with the object of our attention, is a natural ripening of mindfulness and appropriate attention, which we explored last week. And it comes through fruition, it comes to its ripeness and its maturity through our meditation practice. Assuming that we've cultivated a, a firm foundation in um, ethics, in sila, um, in mindfulness trainings, because from the Buddhist perspective, how can our mind be truly concentrated if we're behaving in ways that harm ourselves or others? And another important factor is good instruction from a meditation teacher that understands us, that understands our situation. And then the third factor is a suitable environment. So the cultivating of understanding um, the ways uh, that our behavior affects ourselves and others and like relating to the world around us in, in a way that reflects our values and treating ourselves with the same kindness, receiving um, good instruction, helpful instruction, and then a helpful and supportive environment, an environment that supports um, our aspiration. This uh, factor of environment is an interesting one because of course, on one level, it means a helpful and supportive outer environment, but on a deeper level, it also means a suitable subject for meditation because this is our environment for practice. Each of our minds has different tendencies as we've touched upon in previous talks. If our root of ill will um, of hatred is strong, then a, a good, a helpful and beneficial subject of meditation would probably be something like loving kindness or compassion. Um, not necessarily the meditations on your body as a corpse. That might not necessarily in the initial stages transform the root of uh, ill will. A good teacher through um, observing the way a student walks, eats, sits and so on will have a an idea um, about what might be the main tendencies of that person and might suggest some uh, helpful subjects of meditation. One size doesn't necessarily fit all, just like the hat story that I um, told you when I was in Plum Village last year and trying to get a hat. Um, and I was very, because it was actually a heat wave, um, which seems like a, 
at this point in time, as we're experiencing some of the coldest days that have been experienced in the Blue Mountains for a while now, we had snow um, just up the road here yesterday, quite heavy snow. Uh, it seems like a, a lovely dream to be in a, in a heat wave, but that the heat will come. Uh, anyway, last year I was in Plum Village in the middle of a heat wave and I needed a, a hat. So I, um, I went in and I saw a hat that had a, a label on it that says one size fits all. So I was quite confident when I uh, got that hat, but unfortunately it didn't fit in my head. So um, I took it as a great spiritual lesson to understand that one size does not necessarily fit all. There's not any one size fits all roadmap of the spiritual journey. So it's not helpful to, to uh, buy our second hand. In the commentaries, there are 40 types of meditation that are spoken about. Um, we won't go into much detail about them since in the Plum Village tradition, we focus our attention on mindfulness of breathing, the four establishments of mindfulness and the development of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. These key and concrete meditation subjects form a complete path of practice. But from your emails and the comments, um, which I read with a lot of interest, I sense that there are many other list lovers out there um, who listen to these talks and who are part of the Compassionate Ocean Sangha. So I will list out um, in general um, the meditation subjects, just so that you can have a sense of what these 40 subjects might be and it'll save you um, some uh, mental energy. Um, you can focus your mental energy elsewhere. There, the first 10 of these are the 10 recollections. Um, and the 10 recollections are a, a collection of various subjects for meditation. The first three are reflections on the qualities of the triple jewel, um, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And in order to develop those meditations, just as a basic um, kind of instruction, we reflect on the qualities that are listed in the texts um, in the, that we, we find in the, in the Pali Canon or in the, the ancient texts. For example, the verse on, of the Buddha, um, it consists of nine qualities that uh, the Buddha possesses. Um, in Pali, it's the verse beginning, Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambudo. Um, and so it literally translated, um, just as a basic translation, it means such indeed is the blessed one. The blessed one is worthy, fully self-enlightened, endowed with knowledge and conduct, fortunate, knower of the worlds, the incomparable tamer of, train, of trainable humans, teacher of divine beings and humans, fully awakened and blessed. So with that contemplation, um, you contemplate those qualities of, of the Buddha, those nine qualities. And then um, there's also a verse uh, about the Dharma, there's a verse about the Sangha. So you take those as your um, meditation subjects and contemplate uh, those beautiful characteristics of the Buddha, those beautiful characteristics of the Dharma and beautiful characteristics of the Sangha. And those subjects would be suitable for people of a, a certain temperament, perhaps those who are inclined to a devotional temperament, for example. And so the next three um, contemplations also rely on ancient um, texts um, to develop them. And that's the meditation on sila, on mindfulness trainings or ethics on generosity and the potential for cultivating um, beautiful qualities in ourselves. And I've shared about this um, practice with uh, our friends in the Compassionate Ocean Sangha uh, a while back now, actually, about um, how it can be a beautiful practice. And it was recommended as a practice by the Buddha to spend time in our meditation to reflect on our own good qualities to celebrate our own um, goodness. Um, usually we tend to think of this as being self-indulgent um, or somehow self-aggrandizing, but in fact, it gladdens the mind and gives us confidence in our own transformation and waters so many good seeds in us. And the Buddha uh, recommended it as a subject for contemplation. Um, 
And I often find that it's a beautiful way to water your own flower, um, to be able to uh, generate that sense of brightness and gladness in the mind and have a very delightful meditation. If I begin uh, by reflecting on my own good qualities, even if let's say on a certain day, I can only think of one or two. Um, most of us can, can think of many more, of course, but there might be days in which we're sitting there and we can only think of one or two. Um, but that's already a wonderful thing. That's already a moment in which um, we're able to touch our inner goodness. And that's the point at which Buddhism and the transformational practice of Buddhism begins when we're able to acknowledge to ourselves once and for all that we have the capacity to wake up, that we have these beautiful qualities within us that we can nurture and bring forth. That's a beautiful moment. So I really recommend that that uh, practice. Um, and then comes uh, developing mindfulness and awareness of death, um, the contemplation of the nature of the body, the mindfulness of breathing, and lastly, the contemplation of peace. So those are the 10 um, recollections. That's, so there's 10 of the 40 subjects already. And then there are the four divine abidings, the four Brahma Viharas. Um, developing meditations and radiations of love and kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity. Then there are practices called the Ten Kasinas. And the Kasinas, which are not widely taught out of quite specialized environments, um, are objects that represent basic qualities. Um, Four of them represent the primary elements, such as the earth, um, water, fire, and air. And four represent colors, um, blue, yellow, red, and white discs. And then the other two represent light and space. Um, so each of these ancient devices, which again are not really um, uh, taught very often um, these days um, in most environments, are um, concrete objects that are placed in front of a meditator and they're representative of the quality that it signifies. So as a simple example, the earth uh, casino, the earth object would be a circular disc filled with clay and, and so on. And those meditations are done under the close guidance of, of a teacher. And then there are the 10 um, unattractive objects and basically, they're the different stages um, of the disintegration of our body. And then the four immaterial states, um, which are the foundations for deep levels of samadhi, which we'll talk uh, about a little uh, bit later in this evening's talk, um, called absorptions, the base of infinite space, um, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of interbeing or emptiness or nothingness and the base of neither perceiving nor non-perceiving. Um, then there's the one perception um, and the one perception, which sounds very Zen, um, but the one perception is the perception of um, nutriment um, and uh, the, all the different aspects of nutriment. Um, and it, it's a meditation topic that um, is designed to reduce our tendency to run after things, um, to think that we need, that we lack something and we need um, to fill ourselves up in some way, whether it's our body or our mind. And then there's the one analysis, which um, is the contemplation of our body in terms of the four primary elements, which we've already discussed um, last week when we explored um, right mindfulness. So I know exactly what you're, you're thinking. What on earth should I focus on? Um, how do I know where to start? This is so confusing with all of these different um, subjects of meditation. So as you can imagine, there's been a lot written over the past 2,600 years of um, how to select a meditation subject. But in Plum Village, um, our teacher Tay has recommended um, mindfulness of breathing um, as an incredibly helpful meditation subject that can take us all the way to um, the, the completion of the path. Um, the four establishments of mindfulness and the four immeasurable minds, seeing that these 
uh, practices are accessible. They're very concrete um, and they're excellent meditation subjects and also um, quite delightful meditation subjects that reduce our tendency to think too much um, and that they can bring about deep and lasting transformation from the very ground up. When um, many years ago, I was, I was thinking about um, the vow that we make in Mahayana Buddhism, um, the vow to learn all the Dharma doors. Um, the, the actual vow is Dharma doors are limitless. I vow to practice them all. And I was contemplating if they're limitless, how on earth can I practice them all? How is that possible? Um, sometimes we have enough challenges just simply following uh, an in-breath and an out-breath. How am I going to master the other 83,999 if I consider there to be 84,000 Dharma doors? And I was walking into the meditation hall of Deer Park and as I walked in um, and I was sitting in the hall, and holding this contemplation in my mind, I noticed that there were many doors into the Deer Park Meditation Hall. And as people were coming in, they were coming into various doors, um, leaving their shoes at one door or another. And once they'd actually walked through whichever door was most convenient for them and walked into the Meditation Hall, it really was not so important which door they'd come through. Um, what was important was that they stayed in the room that uh, the door that we walk through, whether it's the door of mindfulness of breathing, or it's the door of the four establishments of mindfulness, or it's the door of cultivating loving kindness, um, then it's the door through which we walk through in order to enter the room. And if we're practicing deeply, it's the entering of the room that is most important and staying in the room. And once we're all in the room together, it doesn't really matter which door we walk through. So in terms of the practice, in order to master all the Dharma doors, apply ourselves fully to one. Um, we hear so often in, in Zen, the one contains the all and the all contains the one. So you don't need to take these 40 subjects of meditation and have a checklist and say, right, this week I'm going to be mastering the 10 recollections. And then next week I'm doing the four um, uh, immeasurable minds. And then after that, maybe just for a little break, I'll do the four establishments of mindfulness and then, and so on and so on. Um, just go deeply into to one um, because that's the beauty of uh, the Buddhist path. The one contains the all and we can touch all things by entering deeply one thing. So this sense of uh, deep oneness with um, our meditation object or deep oneness um, in general, samadhi or immersion, it grows in stages. So having cultivated right mindfulness and choosing our meditation subject, let's say the breath, we sit in meditation and our first practice, the very initial practice for each one of us is to be able to cultivate the capacity to rest our attention with our breath. Notice that I said rest with, I didn't say rest our attention on. And that's quite intentional um, because I, I find that um, as we go a little bit more deeper into meditation, actually we're bringing a sense of oneness. So we're resting with our breath. Um, we're not uh, resting our attention on our breath is something separate, but we're joining into oneness with the object of our attention. If our mind wanders, which as any meditation practitioner can tell you, it never happens. Mind never wanders. Um, we, <laughs> we notice uh, our mind wandering. We smile to that tendency of the mind. This has been going on for a very long time. So don't beat yourself up about it. Um, we notice it. We bring a sense of friendliness to it. Um, and while not indulging in it, we gently bring our attention back um, and firmly rest it with our breath. This initial stage is actually called preliminary samadhi. Once your mind settles into the practice, um, I've got really great news for you. I got really exciting news for you. Once our mind settles into um, 
attention with the beautiful breath, um, breathing in, breathing out, for example, then the five hindrances are likely to arise. They bubble up from uh, within. I can hear the groans and the disappointment. Um, I can relate. Um, I remember when I was a young practitioner attending a meditation class and the teacher asked us to tell her what meditation was. And I raised my hand. I kept, I was waving it around in the air and I think she took pity on me and she said, okay, you tell us what meditation is. And I was so confident. I said, meditation is balancing the microsm of the body with the macrosm of the cosmos. <laughs> I was really proud of my answer. Um, that's exactly how I, I viewed uh, meditation. The teacher said, no, it's not. Uh, meditation is about remaining with what is. It's about fixing, she actually said, fixing your mind on one point. I gotta tell you, I was, a, I was quite bitterly disappointed. Um, I wanted the lights and the visions, the epiphanies and the poems coming on the breeze. Um, and it was really disappointing um, to me that meditation would bring us back to what's happening right here and now. Um, and what's often what's happening in the here and now are hindrances, either overt or subtle. In addition to um, the joys and the wonders, often we have um, some ill will arising. We might have some restlessness and worry arising. We might have a drowsiness arising. We might have doubt, all of these things. And so I actually think um, that we can be excited um, and quite enthusiastic when we notice the hindrances arising since they themselves, these hindrances themselves are the very ground for practice. And if we notice them arising, that's already a great thing um, since most people don't uh, notice them arising um, and till they've been going on for quite a while. So it's actually a sign that our meditation practice is progressing, believe it or not. Um, so many people think um, that their meditation practice is failing if they notice that there's a strong seed of ill will or hatred coming up or doubt or, or so on. So sometimes these hindrances appear as thoughts sometimes as images, sometimes as obsessive emotions and so on. Maybe um, surges of desire, um, anger, resentment, um, heaviness of mind, agitation and doubts. Um, these hindrances are great practice partners, uh, maybe the best. Um, and with patience, with effort, with a lot of loving kindness and a healthy sense of humor, um, they can be gradually transformed. There are times too many, too many to count that we feel we can't take another step. The hindrances don't just appear in sitting meditation, but most importantly, they appear right in the heart of our daily life. So in so many moments of our life, um, when we bring this quality of mindfulness, in addition to noticing all the wonderful conditions um, that are present for us, which, which is in fact the foundation for us to be able to have any meaningful transformation, just as the cultivation of recognizing our own good qualities is a real um, precursor to any meaningful um, development then um, cultivating um, this attentiveness also helps us to be able to see in our daily life when um, these hindrances arise, either in really strong ways or really subtle ways. As we continue gently bringing our attention back to our breath, certain innate qualities begin to pick up power and connect with each other and guide our mind towards a deeper concentration or samadhi. These are then called, at that point, they're called the factors of absorption or um, to use the Pali term jhana. The Pali term jhana is the, the root of the word uh, Zen or in, in Chinese Buddhism, it's Chan. 
Um, in Vietnamese Buddhism, it's Tien. So uh, it means literally absorption. Um, so the five qualities that um, are innate to all of us, they all of us have them, that slowly as we cultivate this capacity of recognizing, of coming back to our meditation object, returning over and over again, we develop these capacities and they become real powers um, that start to pick up their own uh, uh, life force, becoming uh, quite strong powerhouses of the mind. They are uh, called initial application of the mind, vitaka, sustained application of the mind, vichara, joy, piti, happiness, sukha, and one-pointedness, ekagata. So initial application of the mind, vitaka, is the factor, this capacity that directs our attention anywhere, really, when our mind hasn't been cultivated in terms of mindfulness, but later um, directs our attention towards our meditation subject, in this case, the breath. So it's that initial application of, uh, of mind. The, in the text, Vitaka as a factor of absorption is said to take our mind, to lift it up, and to allow our attention to penetrate the meditation um, object, in this case, the breath, to see it from within, the way that a nail would penetrate through a block of wood. I don't know about you, but there are some times that my mind feels a little bit like a block of wood, a little bit... Uh, heavy, a little bit tired. And then the second uh, factor is sustained application of the mind. So this quality, vichara, stabilizes our attention on our breath, for example, or on our meditation subject, keeping it there through an aspect of this quality that I've uh, encouraged everybody to cultivate, this curiosity, um, this investigation, not having a passive sense, so the first factor um, is the factor of directing our mind somewhere, cultivating that capacity to direct our mind somewhere. And then the second factor is the capacity to remain there, but not remain there just in a passive way. Um, remaining there in an active, engaged, interested and curious way, exploring um, our breath, um, almost having a conversation with your meditation subject experiencing it from a new way every single time. And then the third factor is joy, piti. Um, it's a delight and a joy that accompanies this sense of, um, of uh, a deep interest in our meditation subject, our breath, for example, taking delight in it. Often when I'm leading a guided meditation, I'll invite friends to bring the same interest affection and enthusiasm to their meditation object that they would bring to meeting a dearly beloved friend that they haven't seen for a long time. That's quite a different energy to bring to your meditation, to bring to your breath, to bring to your step, to bring to the cultivation of loving kindness, for example, than just sitting there and saying, right, it's time to focus my attention on my breath, but rather generating that sense of interest and enthusiasm um, around uh, your meditation subject brings about a sense of joy, um, which is always a factor that Tay spoke about uh, in terms of meditation, to enjoy our steps, to enjoy our breath, to enjoy sitting, to sit in such a way, to breathe in such a way, to walk, to eat in such a way that it's the happiest moment that we've experienced up to now. And uh, the next factor is, of course, happiness, sukha. Um, it's the deeply pleasant feeling that always goes along with right samadhi, sama samadhi, um, or immersion. Um, sometimes we might wonder what the difference between joy and happiness is. We might consider to be a joy to be the feeling that we have when we're extremely thirsty and we see a cup of water. And then happiness is the feeling of ease and contentment that occurs after we drink the water. So that's the difference between um, joy and, and happiness. 
So in the fifth and final factor of absorption of jhana is one pointedness, which has the function of unifying all the different um, streams of our mind on the object. It's like this whole feedback loop because it, um, we've had that initial um, directing of our mind there. We've, our mind has remained there through uh, generating a sense of interest, joy and happiness have arisen because it's such a pleasant experience. And then, um, so we want to uh, uh, become even more focused on that meditation subject. It's, a, it's a, a, a cycle like that. So at the same time that the inward hindrances, um, the five hindrances that we've spoken about before are slowly being transformed by mindfulness and by these five factors that we just spoke about, other changes are taking place with our focus. In the beginning, our focus is quite coarse, um, but gradually as a number of us who've meditated for a while can attest, um, we become more sensitive um, and our attention becomes more refined and more subtle. And over time, we become even more interested and more absorbed in our meditation object. The separation is less and less until it can be said that we're dwelling in the neighborhood of our meditation subject. Um, we've moved from being in the same country to being in the same state, um, to being in the same zip code, the same postal code. And now we're right down the street. Um, to continue with this analogy, soon we'll be walking up the pathway, the footpath and uh, knocking on the front door of our meditation subject. And then we'll walk into the room. We're not quite there yet. We're still in the neighborhood. We're meditation object adjacent, uh, but we're getting there. In our mind in the beginning of our meditation practice is a bit like a toddler that's just learning to walk. We take a few steps, we fall down, we get up, we walk some more, and then we fall down again. But as we develop uh, mindfulness and concentration, um, our mind, as we we generate uh, these deeper levels of uh, sama samadhi, right samadhi. Um, we're like a person who is able to walk. Um, we get up and we walk straight ahead without um, hesitation. Let's have a sound of the bell. Once we um, have become absorbed in our meditation object, we're finding um, that oneness, that delight, that enjoyment body um, with our meditation object, then uh, there are nine stages of uh, concentration, which are, uh, they are progressively deeper and each one is more subtle and they tend to unfold naturally and sequentially. Um, in general, the jhanas are successively deeper meditation um, states that are, are free from the five hindrances that we spoke about earlier, such as craving, of ill will, of dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and worry, um, and increasingly uh, free of discursive thought. Um, and they contain a, a state of full bodied awareness. So the first four of these are, are called jhanas and many of us are familiar with the jhanas. Kay spoken um, a lot of the a lot about these in um, the heart of the Buddha's teaching in the chapter on um, sama samadhi or right concentration. The first four of these nine factors are uh, the jhanas, the four jhanas or absorptions. The second four are the four immaterial states, and then the final one is called cessation. Um, so within the context of this talk. We're not going to go into too much depth on the, the jhanas. And I, I recommend that you consider reading Tay's book, The Heart of the Buddha's Teaching, 
which gives some details about the jhanas in the chapter on uh, Sama Samadhi or right concentration, as I just mentioned. And another book is um, Ajahn Brahm's wonderful book, Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond. So in terms of the Noble Eightfold Path and the path factor of right or complete concentration or right or complete Samadhi, Sama Samadhi, the four jhanas, um, they make up the usual definition of right concentration. In fact, the Buddha says in the Dinga Nikaya, number, Sutra number 22, and what friends is right concentration? Uh, separated from sense pleasures, separated from unbeneficial states. A practitioner enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by initial and sustained application of mind, which we spoke about earlier, filled with joy and happiness born of seclusion. Then with the subsiding of initial and sustained thinking by gaining inner confidence and unifying their mind, they enter and dwell in the second jhana, which is free from initial and sustained thought, but is filled with the joy and happiness born of immersion. With the stilling of joy, they dwell in equanimity, in inclusiveness, mindful and clearly comprehending and experience in their own person the bliss of, of which the noble ones say, happy are those who are equanimous and mindful. And thus they enter and dwell in the third jhana. With the transformation of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, they enter and dwell in the fourth jhana, which has neither pleasure nor pain and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This, friends, is right concentration. So have you ever had the experience of having an, um, uh, an amazing discovery, an amazing experience, something that completely changes your orientation to life? And then a few weeks or months or years later, you look back, maybe you journaled about it or you just uh, made a mental note or you're, you're coming back and reflecting on it a, a little while later and you realize that at the time you thought it was ultimate it was amazing it was mind-blowing um, but in fact looking back from this perspective it has continued to grow and unfold and looking back what you thought was the ultimate was just a little appetizer just a little taste maybe an am amuse bouche for those of us who are in the in the, the chefing industry so it's the same way with the the jhanas with um, the stages of meditation stages of absorption each uh, of each successive level of the the jhanas is a deeply profound and paradigm shifting experience and it's a deepening and refining of the previous one um, it's almost as if, as you, you heard in the text, um, in, in uh, entering these beautiful qualities, these beautiful experiences, in order to enter the successive one, you have to let go of the one before. And so um, each one is uh, like meditative concentration is so delightful that it can be so easy to just uh, stay uh, in a certain uh, kind of mind state and not allow things to grow to their fruition. Because as we've learned in Buddhism, for things to grow to their fruition, um, we need to be able to develop the capacity to let go, to not hold on. And in these uh, states, these absorptions, they can be so, uh, and they are so delightful that there's a tendency to hold on very tightly to those experiences and to not allow them to, to develop and to grow. Just like we know a tree by its fruit, in the same way as you heard in the text, we know these experiences, these um, deep experiences of, of samadhi, these jhanas, by the qualities that bloom in our mind and heart. In the first jhana, it said we experience um, joy and pleasure, which is born from withdrawal, from uh, being secluded. Um, and in this jhana, our body is saturated um, with the joy and pleasure of letting go, of withdrawal. Um, 
so often we define happiness as coming from outer sensory input. But here, it's radical because um, happiness and joy wells up from within by doing what is uh, counter to our, some of our innate tendencies to focus outward. Um, our mindfulness and our, our concentration are developing and growing to such uh, to an extent that we're actually finding a lot of uh, stillness and joy within. So in addition to this saturation of joy and, and bliss of happiness, then this first jhana has five factors, applied thought, sustained thought, joy, happiness, and one pointedness of mind. Um, those innate qualities that we have already in our mind, but they've been developed to um, their fullness and they, they uh, are manifest in this jhana. So after a while of being in this absorption, we start to feel like there might be something more. Um, and so naturally our mind draws more inward and lets go of certain outer factors. And so in this absorption, there are four main factors that begin to, to flow up. Uh, joy and happiness, one pointedness and a deep confidence. And this is an amazing experience. But after some time, we begin to notice that there, there might still be a little sense of agitation in the quality of joy that's suffusing our being. And so slowly, our awareness um, is becoming more subtle. And as joy becomes more subtle and refines into something else, we enter into like a deeper form of this absorption where we, we experience the saturation of happiness and one pointedness and over time without any efforting again the path unfolds for each one of us in and of itself um, we begin to notice ourselves drawn, drawn towards inclusiveness um, or that all-embracing quality of equanimity um, of neither being pulled into something or pushing anything or anyone away. Um, and we begin to naturally experience the deepening of the saturation of happiness into equanimity, into a deep experience that's be beyond the usual categories of painful or pleasant. So it's these deep experiences that are what the Buddha is speaking about when he's speaking about right concentration or sama samadhi or right immersion um, as a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. So beyond those four jhanas are what are called the four immaterial states, which are highly refined levels of absorption, which are named after the objects that naturally present themselves to us as objects of contemplation. Um, and we've mentioned them already, the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of interbeing or emptiness, and the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So we don't need to worry about uh, those things and try to memorize them because um, if we are able to focus our attention on our breath and develop the 16 exercises of mindfulness of breathing, then at the right moment in the right time, these objects present themselves naturally to, to the mind. You'll remember last week that I spoke about developing two capacities, well, actually three interrelated capacities. One is the capacity to zoom in our attention on a micro level, which is what we've been talking about so far this evening, really zooming in on a micro level in a way. The other is to zoom out on a more macro or general level. Um, and the third capacity is to know which kind of attention to uh, is appropriate when, which kind of attention to use in which situation. Once a student came to a teacher and asked him to share with him the essence of the path and the teacher took a sheet of paper and wrote attention. The student asked the teacher to explain a little more. And so the teacher wrote attention, attention. And the student still didn't understand. So the teacher wrote, attention, attention, attention. Uh, there's the wonderful Zen story 
of a, a wonderful um, nun who she was giving a Dharma talk and she asked everybody, uh, she raised a fist like so and asked everybody, what's this? And um, people just had nothing to say. Like they were looking at her and she said, it's deformed. And then um, a few seconds later, she said, what's this? And then she said, it's deformed. We need uh, both qualities. We need to know when to zoom in, when to focus in, and when to be able to zoom out and have a macro form of attention. Otherwise, um, uh, we will have some kind of lack in our, our spiritual development or a meditative development. For me as a child, I, I feel like I got um, a lot of great meditative um, uh, teachings from some of the experiences I had as a child. And I went to a school where they were really big on um, discipline. Um, and every week we would have an assembly and they would, um, uh, we would be lined up in rows and they would, uh, there was a, a loudspeaker system and they would um, say attention and we would all have to um, you know, come to attention and stand at attention. Um, this, was, this was primary school, this was elementary school. <laughs> we had to stand at attention and then um, after a while, um, after a couple of things of the assembly, they would say stand at ease and then we would have to take a different posture. And so I felt like these two uh, qualities of coming to attention and standing at ease are also other ways to approach um, zooming in and zooming out. Um, we need to be able to stand at attention with our, um, our awareness and also to be able to stand at ease, um, to be able to zoom out a little bit while never losing sight of our meditation uh, object, but to be able to see the larger macro picture, to be able to stand at ease. These two uh, qualities are really important qualities for a meditator. So the kinds of samadhi that we've been speaking about this evening um, are generated by resting our mind on one point, like our breath, our step, and so on. But there's another way to develop, to cultivate um, and uh, concentration. And that is once we've established a foundation of mindful attention, rather than zooming in to a micro level of attention, we can notice and cultivate an awareness of the changes that occur in our body and mind each and every moment without getting stuck. Um, we develop this flowing um, form of concentration. How? We develop it by cultivating the four establishments of mindfulness, um, which is one of the key practices of Plum Village. So I, I can guess what some of you are, are thinking. Um, yay, we've reached the end of the Noble Eightfold Path. Finally, two months of the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, though right immersion, concentration, or samadhi is the final factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, right samadhi, right concentration in and of itself is not the end of the path. Developing samadhi calms our body and mind, but might not necessarily generate the insight that transforms and that liberates we can run the risk of just becoming blissed out. Well, from one perspective, that's, especially at this moment in time, that's not such a bad thing, right? Well, it's already a great step forward. But remember that our ultimate aim as spiritual practitioners, um, for many of us, is to transform our suffering and to liberate ourselves and others um, from this endless round of Sangsara, this endless round of the same thing over and over again. To transform and to free ourselves from our situation, to transform our suffering, we need to apply all the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path as a tool, um, as a tool of, or as a lens of discovery into our lived experience in order to generate insight to look into and experience a deeper level of, um, of things. So this is a new uh, level of right view and right intention. Up until now, these two initial path factors have only been working in an introductory way to spark us on our journey 
And now we circle back and on a slightly deeper level, right view now penetrates below the surface layers and right intention becomes clearer. And it's born out of this direct seeing of things for ourselves. You might be wondering why concentration is not enough to bring about liberation. This is because concentration doesn't necessarily help us to understand the roots of our suffering, our ill will, our anxiety, our depression, and so on. It can calm these things down and can calm them down very well, but it doesn't necessarily uproot them. That's the function of wisdom or, or insight. And wisdom, which is born from we ourselves having the courage to directly look at what's arising in our mind and our heart and to examine why and how it came to be. From being willing to apply the path factors in each and every moment to help us to be able to touch and to transform the most fundamental and deepest root that we have, the root of ignorance. As much as we wish it to be different, we can't gain wisdom from reading or listening to Dharma talks or just thinking about the practices. That would be good, wouldn't it? Um, but by directly applying these path factors in our daily life with confidence. There's that old joke that knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom is not putting it in the fruit salad. From looking at our own experience through the lens of the Noble Eightfold Path, wisdom, even if it's just a little current in the beginning, a little stream that will eventually um, take over a whole river, it begins to arise right from within the heart of our own life, not from somewhere else, from our own experience. And then we don't need anybody uh, to tell us anything. Because just as it says in our chants, in one of the beautiful chants of Plum Village, happiness is knowing that you're on the right path. This deep sense of rooted confidence, born of our own experience of transformation, is one of the key factors of the path. Let's have a sound of the bell. Dear beloved community, over the past eight weeks, we've explored together in a very basic and introductory way the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, I hope that you found something helpful and concrete for you in your own practice, and that you've been able to touch these factors of the Noble Eightfold Path in a new, um, a new way or a broader way than um, you maybe have had an experience to, to, um, to touch up until now. And, for me, I really, uh, I want to reiterate, I really recommend Tay's wonderful book, The Heart of the Buddha's Teaching, um, to explore the Noble Eightfold Path um, and the Four Noble Truths more deeply. Um, next week, we're going to uh, begin our exploration on the Four Noble Truths. Um, these teachings, the Noble Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths, were requested by members of the Compassionate Ocean Sangha. So this these uh, last couple of months have been a little like an a la carte um, uh, series, an a la carte Dharma talk series. So the noble, Four Noble Truths have also been uh, requested. And then once we've uh, worked through the Four Noble Truths, we'll take a step uh, off to the side and I'm going to share a series um, uh, that I, I would like to, to offer um, just to, uh, as, a, as a little offering from me, I'll share about that another time. Uh, before we circle back to the other topics that the Compassionate Ocean Sangha and others have requested. Um, usually the Four Noble Truths are taught before the Noble Eightfold Path, since the Noble Eightfold Path is actually the fourth of the Four Noble Truths. But I decided um, to teach the other way around. 
um, since the Noble Eightfold Path is incredibly practical. Um, and as I just mentioned, it's actually the fourth noble truth, which means for the next um, three weeks, we'll be exploring the other three of the four noble truths. Um, I do hope that you've received um, some blessings out of this series of talks. It's been a delight to be able to share with you and may it be one of many blessings on your path. We'll end with the sound of the bell. <laughs>